Oh, no. I don't travel too far for that. Yo, E, what up? <laughs> hey, man, are you guys having a party up there? Yeah, I can hear it. Um, yeah, have you looked at the schedule? It's right there on the whiteboard. Yeah, that's awkward. Hey, um, you know, let's compromise. How about you just have everybody wait out on the balcony for like 30 minutes, that's all I need. All right, cool, We're on. I'm headed up. CSI Starbase. Now, before moving on to oh, Starbase, wow. stuff, a big thanks to you. These guys just hanging out in here watching Marcus House, huh? Issues with being unsubscribed last week. Huh. Automatically unsubscribed? I've never even considered that. Maybe that's the reason why 66% of returning viewers aren't subscribed. I don't think you can lose subscribers if they are never there to begin with. Man, nobody even asked you. Close the door. You know you only have 29 minutes left, right? All right, looks like we're finally able to give a few minutes of peace and quiet, so let's go ahead and hop into it. Before we get into this week's deep dive, I think it's a good idea that we get our feet wet with some smaller updates from this week. So let's start out next door with high bay number two. You know, there's some pretty obvious final touches that still need to be made to the upper deck of high bay two. Things like HVAC and electrical utility work, as well as glass panels and all the furniture required for them to finally release both sides of high bay number one to CSI Starbase. You know, we're not gonna talk about those details today though because there's a lot more functional additions that are taking place inside the, uh, you know, business area of the bay. So if you guys have been watching the RGB Aerial Photography Weekly live streams, which air every Saturday, then you may remember hearing about what we refer to as the high bay work towers. So this is kind of hard to understand because the high bay itself is a tower, so, this is like a tower within a tower, or tower inception, inception, inception. This image was taken on June 17th, shortly before the Buckner LR11000 Super Crane packed its bags to leave Starbase indefinitely after a year of some pretty impressive work. But just because it's gone doesn't mean all the major work inside of High Bay 2 is now complete. At the bottom of the image, you can see an odd looking structure being assembled. When I saw it in this early stage, I was hoping this would be some sort of crazy balcony for the top of High Bay 2, but after further review, I think this is actually part of a mezzanine for the interior of the bay. This is the first appearance of the super heavy sized IKEA set that will likely play a huge role in reducing the size of the United Rentals fleet needed inside of High Bay 2. There are a lot of possibilities for how this might be used and it's really hard to tell what the end product will be until we know how many of them there are, but I will explain what we know so far. About a week after it was initially spotted, it became more obvious that this structure was designed to be mounted into a corner. You can see the L-shaped cutout of what would otherwise be a symmetrical platform. This cutout will allow this particular platform to be mounted somewhere in the rear left corner of High Bay 2. The reason I believe it will be used in this corner is because of the positioning of the rectangular penetration through the concrete floor of the upper deck. Currently, there is a large scaffolding tower that runs from the bay floor all the way up to the roof. It's safe to assume that one day there will be a second elevator in this corner. There is already additional railing for another elevator mast sitting just outside of High Bay 1. A mirrored version of this platform would fit around the opposite elevator and also the staircase, which is in the front left corner of the bay. You can see it here in this aerial shot before the roof was installed. A second set of stairs is also currently under construction, which will probably go in the front right corner of the bay. Looking back outside near High Bay 1 again, we can see additional stairway sections under construction next to the elevator rails outside. I believe they will need at least seven more sections in order to reach the same height as the first stairway, however it seems like they aren't really prioritizing that at the moment. Looking back at that IKEA set, you can see how the platform allows for either the elevators or the stairs to easily access the mezzanine floor. There is also a rounded beam on one side, which has a diameter of just over 9 meters, which we know thanks to the conveniently placed starship ring sections nearby. The reason for making it slightly larger than the 9 meter starship would be to allow for some sort of bumper to be installed on the outside edge later. It would probably look similar to the ones we saw on the SQD claw before they were removed. This would help to prevent any damage that could occur as booster sections are being rolled into position. I'm sure the concrete floor inside of the bay is a lot more leveled than the surface outside in the ring yard, but after seeing how much Booster 8's methane tank wobbled around as it was being transported into High Bay 2, I think a bumper would be a pretty good feature to have, 
if only to add a little extra peace of mind for whoever is responsible for controlling the self-propelled modular transports. Those of you who remember how this building was constructed might be wondering how this is gonna fit in the corners if there are already diagonal cross beams on each level. The structural beams I'm referring to are designed to help the structure resist torsional loads from high winds. These cross beams will simply be removed wherever necessary and then replaced by the large diagonal beam running through the center of the platform, which happens to be the main structural support that everything else attaches to. Installing these earlier in the job would have increased how long it took for SpaceX to begin to use High Bay 2 for not only stacking boosters, but also for scrapping pretty much any 9 meter wide object that may have slipped up and looked at Elon the wrong way in the past. So looking forward to the present day, we can see now that there are at least four of these in various stages of construction. There are also at least four newly constructed bridges with handrails installed laying nearby. If you look at the handrails in the corner platforms, you can see the missing sections where these bridge platforms were made up against. Unfortunately, even now, this still isn't enough for us to determine what it will look like. This system of platforms could end up only being one or two levels going around the perimeter, or like I said at the beginning, these could just be the first few sections of a large, intricate tower system planned for the inside of the bay. Not only is there extra material laying around for even more platforms and bridges to be constructed, but there are also a few random stairways laying around site which have even further complicated things. At this point, if more and more of these continue to arrive on site, we could be looking at a High Bay 2 that looks vastly different from High Bay 1 next door. I mean, it probably looks something like this if you walked inside of it right now. But I think in the coming weeks and months, it will begin to more closely resemble the interior of another famous structure we all know and love, and that is NASA's VAB at the Kennedy Space Center. Wow, that's crazy, right? Anyways, we're gonna keep you guys updated on the situation once we know more. Typically, we like to have a nice 3D model to go along with it, so hopefully we'll have that for you guys next time as well. In the meantime, let's talk about another work platform that we've been keeping our eyes on lately. We all know that SpaceX is really good at finding solutions to problems. One problem which they solved a long time ago was how to install, swap, or perform maintenance on Raptor engines while the booster is sitting on the orbital launch mount. This is currently accomplished by using this extendable Raptor service stand, which many folks might be pretty familiar with now because it's been getting a lot of use lately under the OLM. While this Raptor service platform is super convenient, it kind of leaves something to be desired. If we look at it from above, you can see that it really isn't that large. At most, you can probably work on three to six Raptors at a time without having to reposition it. I had a feeling that this method of servicing the aft section of the booster was destined for an overhaul at some point. So for about six months now, I've been on the lookout for any signs of a version two Raptor maintenance platform that would give them significantly more workspace. SpaceX's solution to this problem actually appeared for the first time during one of the RGV Starbase weekly live streams on June 18th. Usually we have a day or two to prepare for these shows, but this time Mauricio completed the flyover just minutes before we went live, so these images were hot off the press. Like a lot of you, I consider myself a creature of habit, and normally I would rather be able to take the time to do my own research before the show, but it was a lot of fun viewing these images for the first time with the live stream audience and having a chance to figure this out as a team. So, those of you who haven't seen this before are probably wondering how SpaceX will get this shiny ass aluminum tortilla underneath the launch mount. This is accomplished by folding down the two side flaps like a taco and then rolling it between the legs of the OLM. In order to transport it while the flaps are folded down, it needs a pretty tall stand, and luckily there is one sitting right next to the assembly area, which has been posted up here since January. I'm not gonna lie, I've been waiting about seven months just to find out what this frame would be used for. In my opinion, this is just one of many projects that SpaceX put on the back burner as a result of whatever issues caused Booster 4 to no longer be considered as the orbital test flight candidate. Because SpaceX no longer planned to even static fire those engines, a massive work platform like this wasn't really necessary. Well, it sure is now. Once the platform was completed late last week, I watched as the transport stand was moved into a clearing, and then a few hours later, the platform was also lifted into place. It took less than five hours to attach it to the stand and move it to the launch site. So that tells me that this is not permanently attached. There's no welding or anything here. So I have a feeling that this is gonna come off the transport stand just as quickly as it went on. Mauricio was able to get a shot of it later in the day once he arrived at Starbase. So now that we're able to see it up close, you can get a better understanding for how it works. Once the new Starbase taco truck has driven between the launch mount legs and is situated perfectly in the center, the flaps can be folded upwards where it will likely have to be held in place while workers manually install seven locking pins onto each flap. Once those are in place, it should hold itself upright. 
I imagine that future versions of this will have an automated locking system. So now that we understand this part, there are two more important questions to answer. Number one, how are the flaps going to be lifted in the first place since there are no hydraulics in sight anywhere on this transport stand? And you can't really fit a crane underneath the launch mount at the same time. Question number two, since there are no hydraulics like the scissor lift mechanism on the original Raptor service stand, how is SpaceX going to get this thing all the way up to the bottom of the launch mount? Let's not forget, this Starship launch pad is ridiculously tall. Well, obviously SpaceX has solved that one as well, and the solution to this one is rather interesting. During the most recent RGV Aerial Starbase Weekly livestream, we were trying to answer this same question when we noticed a random shiny chain hanging off the side of the launch mount. We couldn't really see it that well due to the positioning of the sun when the picture was taken, but luckily one of the Lab Padre camera operators was watching and was able to give us a live close-up of it during the show. Now that we can see it closely, there are two electric chain hoists mounted to the side of the launch mount. You can also see the power cables which were recently ran to them as well. These power cables run to a control box that was installed onto the launch mount within the last week. You can see that here in these before and afters. Now that we know what to look for, when you glance back at the Raptor platform again, you can see the locations where the shackles at the end of the chain hoist will attach. There are two here and another two on the opposite side. In order to lift up the flaps, there are two more lifting locations shown here with matching ones on the other flap. So there are eight lifting points in total and eight chain hoists on the launch mount. Once all eight connection points are attached, the chain hoist can raise both flaps and lift the platform off of the transport stand. After that, the transport stand will be moved out of the way so the platform can be lowered all the way to the ground. That's right, no more boom lifts and cranes. Raptors can be lifted onto the platform using a forklift. Then the workers can hop right on and ride it all the way up like an aircraft carrier. I wouldn't expect to ever see more than a few Raptors on this platform at the same time. These chain hoists are probably limited to about two tons each, so that would be a 16 tons total. And you also have to subtract away the weight of the platform as well. So we're probably looking at around 10 tons of lifting capacity or about five one and a half ton Raptor engines, plus a few custom pallet jacks and a bunch of humans with ladders. So in order to actually be useful for servicing Raptors, when the elevator platform is lifted to its max height, it will be roughly level with the top of the old Raptor service stand shown in this image. One thing you can also see here is two brackets which have recently been attached to the launch mount as well. These brackets correspond with the eight tabs shown in these locations. Once we zoom in closer, we can see that these will likely require locking pins to be inserted manually once the platform is in position. After these pins are in place, the real party can begin, because we will never be able to see what they are doing to those Raptor engines underneath the launch mount ever again. 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 So before we move into the main investigation for this week, I think it's a good idea that we cover some of the updates at Starbase Kennedy as well. I'm sure by now that most of you have probably seen some of the new imagery that was released by Greg Scott and Fariel Mohans on Twitter last week. All right, I'm going to level with you guys. We can continue to issue search warrants and file subpoenas against these guys all we want, but that's not going to be enough to keep them up in the air. If you guys would like to contribute to the weekly flyovers, then I highly recommend joining Greg Scott's Patreon, which you can find the link for in the description. With that, let's see what we have going on at the Roberts Road facility this week. So right off the bat, the thing that stands out the most here is the fact that the entire Mechazilla system is already under construction. That includes both chopsticks, the carriage that the chopsticks are mounted to, and the GSE arm. Considering two weeks ago there was nothing more than a single booster landing rail visible, this is a major change. There are a lot of things I could talk about here, but I think I will save them for another episode. For now, I want to point out a detail that I need y'all's opinion on. If you look at the chopsticks in their current state, they appear to be about 40% shorter than the first set of chopsticks at Starbase. There is a possibility that SpaceX will add additional sections onto the left and right arms shown here, but I'm not so sure about that. If you look at the two landing rails, one of them appears to be much longer than the other. The interesting thing about this, the landing rails were delivered as one single piece. If one of them is shorter, it's because part of it was chopped off. If we zoom in closely, it appears that the second one is in the process of being chopped in half as well. Is this even realistic for the chopsticks to be shortened by this amount? Well, when we look at this overhead render provided to us by 3D Forensics Agent Too Legit to Quit 3D, we can see that they are still the perfect length to reach the middle of the launch mount during stacking of booster and starships. This will significantly reduce the margin of error available though when catching the two massive vehicles. As I said, let me know in the comments what you guys think about this. 
Do you really feel like SpaceX has increased its confidence in the chopsticks catching procedure so much that they would shorten the arms before ever attempting to land a booster on it for the first time? All I have to say is, this would be extremely bold. But because this is SpaceX we're talking about, I honestly wouldn't be that surprised at all. Anyways, moving on to the orbital launch tower assembly area, let's start by checking in with that fifth tower section. In this image from Greg Scott, we can see that SpaceX is making a lot of progress on the fifth section. Uh, well, kind of. I mean, it looks mostly the same to me. However, you can see that the hydraulic accumulators, which control the large pistons in the chopsticks and the GSE arm, are now installed into the tower section. There is still a lot more work that needs to be done in here before it's ready to move. Hopefully, next time we see the fifth section, there will be a lot more progress with getting all the cryo tubes, check valves, basket strainers, and mechanical pipe work installed in here as well. This is kind of crazy to say, but I was honestly expecting a little more progress in this area. As you can see, all of the structural steel for the 8th and 9th sections are already on location. The only thing missing is about 7 more columns. Four of them will be the same size as this short one right here, and the other three should be a bit larger. So, those of you who are as intimate with Stage 0 as your boy Zach here may have realized that this piece does not exist on the first orbital launch integration tower at Starbase. When we look at the upper sections of the tower in this amazing panoramic photo from Starship Gazer, you can see that the 8th section is made up of four columns that are all two-thirds the length of a normal column. And there are also three even shorter columns on the 9th section that are one-third of the normal length. If you compare these to what we see on the ground at the Roberts Road site, these are most definitely not the same. Given that this shorter section arrived before the two-thirds length column that we were expecting, I'm going to assume for now that this is a part of the new section 8. So instead of having two or three levels, this one will only have a single floor, which means the top section will be two floors instead of one, like this. So the question now is, why? Why would they do this? Actually, the better question is, why didn't they do it the first time? Back when the first tower was constructed, it was the common assumption that SpaceX was splitting the 8th and 9th sections into two different pieces because they were likely approaching the lifting capacity for this configuration of the LR11350. So this is what the 8th section ended up looking like. As you can tell, it's kind of an awkward shape. Once it's connected to the load spreader, it took forever to balance the load out. The same was true for the 9th section of the tower, which was also an uneven load. This one was even worse, however, due to the large pulley mounted on the nose. There were also four large shivs placed asymmetrically on either side of the center line. Rigging the 9th section for that final lift took an entire workday. I remember the first time the crane operator applied tension to the load spreader, this is what it looked like. I feel like there were thousands of folks watching the live stream expecting it to be lifted the very first attempt, but back at the CSI Starbase headquarters, we knew it was going to be a long day. If I remember correctly, it took around six corrections of the adjustment rigging plate before the load spreader was finally level. You can see here how the attachment position of the rigging plate was changed after each attempt. This resulted in either a shorter or longer length of the four individual slings. It's basically the equivalent of adding or subtracting links of a chain. If the eighth section is reduced down to a single level, this means that everything above this line will now be included in the ninth section. This means there will be eight relatively easy lifts and then one majorly unbalanced one to deal with at the end instead of two. If the tower sections aren't fully level, then not only will they be difficult to position, but it can become extremely dangerous once it's fully lifted off of the construction base. You can see a perfect example of that here thanks to Starship Gazer. When lifting from a perfectly balanced position, all four columns will clear the guide pins of the base structure at the same time. If one corner is hanging lower than the rest, however, then when the first three clear the guide pins, the last one will still be holding on. In this situation, it's probably best for the crane operator to lift that last corner off as quickly as possible now so the entire tower section doesn't start to rotate or accidentally lift one of the corners of the base structure off of the ground. Load balancing wasn't the only difficult aspect of the final tower section lifts, however. Using a video of the fourth tower section as it was lifted into place, you can see that there are eight different attachment points that are relatively easy to monitor. Once the alignment pins are lined up, everything slides down into place rather nicely. But by splitting the top section of the tower at the second level instead of the first level, attaching these two sections becomes significantly more complex. First, two temporary beams have to be mounted onto these three columns shown here in order to add some additional stability and help maintain the distance between each column. These are later removed once everything is safely secured. Moving around to the front of the tower, when we look at the right side of the roof structure, you can see two additional temporary beams that had to be added on in order to keep the free hanging diagonal beam from moving around. I say free hanging because this is literally supported by two bolts. 
one on each side of the I-beam, as you can see here, thanks to the incredible amount of resolution on Starship Gazer's camera. This same condition exists on the left side as well. Looking at the nose of the roof section where the large pulley I mentioned earlier is mounted, you can see two smaller posts that must also be aligned perfectly. From the air, there is one more alignment point which may be easier than all the rest because it's basically just a flat plate. I think we can all agree that performing this type of precision alignment is probably a lot easier on the ground where it can be fitted piece by piece instead of trying to fit everything together at one time 450 feet up in the air. All right, if you guys have been enjoying today's episode so far, go ahead and do me a favor and hit that like button because I have a feeling we're gonna lose some of you along the way during this next section because we're gonna go pretty deep here. So hopefully you guys are ready because today we're gonna discuss what happened to the water tank at the orbital tank farm, why it matters, and what SpaceX did to fix this problem. My initial goal for this episode was to finally do this tank farm deep dive explanation. However, it's starting to look to me that SpaceX might actually be a few weeks away from making yet another major change at the tank farm. During the last RGV Aerial Starbase Weekly livestream, I noticed this brand new stainless steel pipe manifold and a pair of five foot long flex hoses that had just been delivered at the Sanchez site. Now, this may not look very important, but I can tell you that there is only one possible thing that this equipment on this trailer can be used for. And that purpose is to significantly upgrade the performance of the liquid oxygen side of the tank farm. If my theory is correct, SpaceX will soon have the ability to load liquid oxygen into the Starship and booster roughly two and a half times faster than they're currently able to. If you want to know more about this, then I recommend checking out last week's RGV Aerial Starbase Weekly livestream, which I have linked in the description. Anyways, while we wait for this change to take place, we can still discuss other parts of the tank farm. On the previous CSI Starbase episode, I mentioned that the two vertical methane storage tanks, which have been sitting unused ever since they failed to be certified for methane storage, were in the process of being converted for another use. Initially, I thought they could be changed over to additional LOX or nitrogen storage, but it turns out it was neither. These two tanks, which were designed for storing cryogenic liquids, are now being used as the primary water storage tanks for the launch complex. From my point of view, it appears that the original water tank was at risk of imminent failure. Water is an important component in the tank farm operation, and not just for static fires and launches. Without a functioning water tank, there would most likely be a significant delay to the first orbital launch. So, in order to avoid that, SpaceX drew up a plan to use these two abandoned tanks for water instead. Say what? All right, in order to explain this, I'm gonna have to start from the very beginning so we can refresh ourselves on the history of this water tank. Before we get started, just keep in mind that there's no way to know for sure whether or not all of these details are 100% correct. So I'm just going to lay out the observations that I've made over the last 17 months, and I'll let you be the judge. All right, here we go. This is what the tank farm looked like when the first recognizable structure finally broke ground. This is way back in January 1st of 2021. A few weeks later on the 14th, there were two ditches that appeared in between what would later be the orbital GSE bunker and the vertical storage tanks. While this was taking place, way on the other side of Starbase at the production site, workers were finishing up assembly on the future underground water pipes that would eventually be laid inside of those ditches. Check out the human for scale standing nearby. This helps you get an idea of how large a 19 inch pipe really is. These ain't for no sprinkler system, I can tell you that. Moving ahead another 10 days, the ditch that was previously visible had disappeared after the water pipes were placed inside of them and covered in dirt. Looking at it from the side, you can more easily see where these pipes start and end. It was pretty early on in this construction process that we were able to determine where the water tank would be positioned thanks to these images. Two months later, we can see that even more clearly. If you didn't know the water pipes were in the ground back then, this would have been the second clue for where the water tank would be placed. You can see seven circular concrete bases in various stages of completion. In the eighth location, next to where the three water pipes exit the ground, you can see that there is no rebar poking out of the ground in order to create a concrete base. Although position number eight has no rebar supports for a circular base, it does have a ring of anchor bolts sticking out of the ground, just like the other seven pads. This was my first sign of a problem. About a week later, the first cryogenic storage vessel, or GSE tank, arrived on location. This nine meter stainless steel tank is basically the same thing as the liquid methane tank on the super heavy booster, except number one, it's just a little bit smaller, and two, it has no internal or external support stringers or ribs, which are present on both the Starship and booster tanks. Hmm, well, that's kind of weird. Don't worry, if you don't understand my concern here, it will make sense later. Anyways, at the same time as this picture was taken, you can see workers on the ground welding metal panels together in order to create a non-porous surface for the base of the tank. 
At this point, I was pretty sure I knew exactly what this tank would end up looking like, but boy was I wrong. While the GSE tanks were being constructed at the production site, the 12 meter cryo shells, which would end up being used to sleeve the 9 meter stainless steel storage tanks, were being constructed with rapid pace over at the Sanchez gas site. Starting on February 26, 2021, we can see four separate domes that are visible with one of them laying in the dirt. To the right of the dome in the middle, you can see one of the 25 panels used to form these domes. Just above that, you can see three workers welding the fourth cap after assembling all the pieces together. One month later, you can see a much larger concrete pad was added to give crews a little more space to work. All eight domes were now visible by this point. By the next week, some important features were in the process of being added to seven out of the eight domes. Even without zooming in, you can see the vent caps added on top of the nipple in the center. This made it really easy to identify which one was the water tank because it's the only one with no vent stack. By April 20th, we had a new crane in town. This Buckner LR1600 has a 600 ton lifting capacity and was used to stack all of the ring sections. You can see several of the domes on the right side which have already been attached to the first ring. Two weeks later, we can see the progress with stacking the first cryo shell. These ring sections are made of 9.5 millimeter sheets of 501 stainless steel. Once these shells are sleeved over the cryogenic propellant storage tanks, they're filled with expanded perlite to create a 1.5 meter thick insulated jacket around the storage tanks. If you've ever held it in your hands before, you know that expanded perlite is almost lighter than popcorn. So the space in between the GSE tank and the cryo shell is filled with somewhere between 30 to 150 tons of expanded perlite. The water tank, on the other hand, should be able to hold close to 2,000 tons of water. Given the nearly two orders of magnitude difference between the hydrostatic pressure these vessels will have to withstand, I would expect the design of the water tank to be a little different than the cryo shell. I am a mechanical engineer, but my knowledge of storage tank design is pretty limited. At the time, I was working in the oil and gas industry and the only water tanks of similar size that I have ever come across all look like this. This is called a minion tank, for obvious reasons. This actually is a temporary water tank which is meant to be assembled and then taken apart quickly, but it still has an important feature that I would expect on all water tanks of this size. This feature is the internal or external ribbing or compression bands. Notice how the spacing between the ribs decreases as you go from the top of the tank down to the bottom where the hydrostatic pressure is the greatest. So as the water tank sections were being stacked, I was really hoping that I would see some signs that additional structural supports would be added. You can see the water tank under construction to the left of this completed shell. To the right is the next ring section preparing to be stacked and yeah, no internal supports in sight. Skipping ahead one month later, the water tank was moved to the tank farm and lifted into position. The first completed cryo shell was sitting in the top right corner position, but there was actually nothing underneath it at the time. It was supposed to go over the first GSE tank, but for some reason they hadn't lifted it yet. At the time, there was a lot of speculation on what the delay was, but I didn't really care because I was more concerned with the fact that neither the water tank nor the GSE tank had structural ribbing added around them. Keep in mind, this was over two months after these two nitrogen tanks were brought to the site. By July 1st, you can see that the water tank had been fully connected to the underground pipes. The pipe on the bottom is the discharge side where the water exits the tank and goes into the bunker. Once the valve opens and the water starts to flow out of the tank, it then goes into the bunker where there is a manifold that splits the flow between at least four of these blue water pumps you see in this image. After this, the water is pumped through a group of heat exchangers which are also inside of the bunker. All right, speculation warning here. I'm definitely not 100% positive on this, but I am pretty sure that this is used for rapidly vaporizing liquid nitrogen or liquid oxygen. Basically, small volumes of cryogenic liquids enter through the port on the left side and exchange heat with the rapidly flowing warm water and then get instantly vaporized into a gas and sent out of the right side through these stainless steel pipes. I think this process might be used to clean out the system by forcefully purging high velocity gas out of an open valve and also to pre-chill the stainless steel cryo tubes before introducing liquid propellants. Sometimes you can even see the liquid pouring out of the vent after the transition from pre-chill gas to propent loading. Like I said, I could be wrong about this, so if you have any better ideas of what SpaceX would use this type of water-based heat exchanger for, then let me know in the comments. In my opinion, I just don't think natural boil off within the insulated cryo tubes is enough to produce the intense level of venting that we see for hours at a time, only to see no signs of actual cryo testing on the booster. It would also explain why this water tank is critical for testing whether there is a static fire or not. 
Anyways, after the water leaves the heat exchangers, it is returned back to the water tank via this pipe which runs all the way up to the top. You will notice that there is another pipe next to it that doesn't have anything connected to it at all. At the bottom of the tank, there is another black pipe coming out of the ground which looks like it should be connected, but it isn't. In my opinion, this is here just in case SpaceX decide to build a desalination plant and needs to pump water from that facility into this tank. <sighs> wow, with that out of the way, let's get back to the story. So, do you remember when I said that the first cryo shell was sitting on an empty base waiting to be sleeved over the first nitrogen tank? Well, two weeks after that image was taken, yet another cryo shell was brought to the tank farm and placed over an empty base, but this time, the reason was now clear as day. Looking at the bottom of the tank, you can see a worker attaching external ribs onto the outside of the first liquid nitrogen tank. Wow, you don't say. Okay, so what about the water tank? She's next, right? Wrong. The very next week, SpaceX started offloading water into the tank for the very first time. Stage Zero Zack was extremely concerned at this point. I really hope they don't fill this up too high because I don't want to see the result of that. After this, about three months had gone by and the tank farm was nearing completion. I was beginning to give up on my theory about this tank being undersupported when one day on October 6th, I noticed a lone boom lift working behind the water tank. When I zoomed in closely, I saw the first signs of paint being stripped off from around the welds towards the top of the tank. Wow. Holy shit. There's no way. I can't tell you how many I told you so's got thrown out that day. It took them all the way until October 18th, or about two weeks to fully strip this tank. The next week, I took a trip down to Starbase for the Halloween Crowfest. And one of the things on my list was to get a close-up of this. I thought for sure by the time I got down there, I would be able to see the first external bracing being added on. When I got there, I quickly searched it from top to bottom looking for signs, but there was nothing. The only thing I could find was a new access hatch that was cut into the side of the tank. I ended up leaving pretty disappointed. For two months, this was the first thing I looked at after every release of flyover images. Until finally, on February 2nd of this year, the tank was repainted. We saw it first from the air, but then on the same day, Mauricio went out to verify it wasn't just a trick of the light. But it wasn't. This was quickly becoming an emotional roller coaster. Every time I got close to giving up, something else would happen. On March 3rd, I was scrolling through pictures of the tank farm. Pretty much everything looked the same until I came across the only picture that was taken from an angle where the sun was just right and you could see in between the tanks. Wait, what's that back there? Some scaffolding? Hey, 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 I think we're back in the game. But it sat there for a month and by April 6th, it was gone. At this point, I decided I was gonna stop talking about it and thinking about it because this is driving me crazy and I don't think people really wanna keep hearing me chasing after ghosts week after week on the RGV Aerial Starbase Weekly live streams. I tried to give up, I really did, but three weeks later, I noticed something that just didn't look right. Why does it look like there's water leaking in two locations on this tank? Am I crazy? I needed some close-up ground images ASAP. Luckily, Starship Gazer was already on site when I noticed this in the flyover images, so he was able to quickly send over a few shots of the tank farm from the ground level. Right away, I noticed something that hadn't been there before, and oddly enough, the worker on the boom lift was going up to take a look. Hmm, what do we have here? A f***ing problem. Zooming in, you can see that it clearly looks like water has been leaking from this weld, and this guy is probably sitting there thinking the exact same thing I was. Over the next few weeks, additional scaffolding was erected around the tanks, and each time Mauricio did a flyover, there seemed to be even more of it. I kept checking for signs of what they were going to be doing to fix this, but I wasn't even sure if it was even real. For the returning viewers who watched the previous CSI Starbase episode, this now takes us to the present day when just a few weeks ago we reported that this manifold, which was previously connected to the two unused vertical methane tanks, was removed and tossed aside. After the manifold was removed, a new pipe was added a week later. Initially, I thought it could be used to convert these unused vertical methane tanks into additional liquid nitrogen or liquid oxygen storage, but it turns out this was not the case. Once I had the chance to see it from the ground, I realized these are actually water pipes. You can see the stainless steel pipe on the left, which exits out of the cryo shell and then turns into a black iron pipe, which definitely is not used for cryofluids. So the only other option is for this to be a water line. Another way you can tell is because of how close the valve actuator is to the actual pipe. This is a short stem valve, which isn't suitable for cryo applications. For that, you need a long stem valve like this one, which keeps the valve actuator motor far away from any ice buildup that will occur. While this conversion was taking place, I noticed a convoy of vacuum trucks showing up to the tank farm. 
I saw about six of them show up immediately after a Booster 7 cryo test. The only thing I can think of that would require that much water removal would be the water tank. SpaceX was not messing around with getting that thing emptied out. In my opinion, it looked like an emergency operation. As I said before, the water tank is way too big to only be used for the small fire suppression system on the launch mount. A functional water tank is critical for all tests that occur both on the launch mount and the two cryo stations next to the berm. So having a functional water tank is an absolute must. The good news in this story is that as of today, the original water tank has been fully disconnected. The discharge and return pipes have now been connected to the two new water tanks, as you can see here. Thanks to CSI Starbase agent Vix, we can also tell you that SpaceX has been spending a lot of time filling these tanks in the last few days, as you can see here. At the time of this episode, SpaceX had offloaded more than 50 of these tankers into the new water tank. As of right now, we have no idea what will happen with that other piece of, I mean, old water tank. But you know what? I don't even care anymore. If you enjoyed this episode and learned something that you didn't already know before, then do me a favor and hit that like button. And also, don't forget to subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. And make sure you hit that alert icon if you don't want to miss all of the future updates, because there's going to be a lot of them. As always, I want to give a huge thank you to all of our CSI Starbase patrons, especially the ones who joined recently after the last episode. If you would like to help us reach the point where we're able to put these episodes out more frequently, you can do so by making a one-time donation via PayPal or by becoming a monthly member on Patreon. We now have a new tier that gives patrons access to the CSI Starbase Discord server. You can find both of those links in the description. For more content like this, you can join me live every Saturday at noon Central Standard Time for the RGV Aerial Starbase weekly live streams. If you missed the last episode, you can get yourself caught up by clicking on this link right here. All right, we'll see you all in the next episode. Until then, Stage Zero Zach, signing out.